Ni hao ma? Kom se, fat sa. I said hello, how are you? And then I said, wish you all uh, blessings in the new year. This is a uh, Chinese New Year. Just we'll celebrate it over the weekend here. And so it's the first Sunday I have a chance to greet you with the new year, the Chinese New Year. And I wore my uh, red stole today. It's not the proper color. I should be wearing my green, but I wore my red stole today because it's, my, it's decorated in Chinese colors and uh, fashion here. I have uh, the dragon and the phoenix um, on my stole, and I celebrate Chinese with you. And I also thought it might be appropriate because as we read from the scriptures today, as we encounter Paul's letter to the Corinthians, his first letter to the Corinthians, they seem to be really fired up about this business of speaking in tongues that the church received when? At the day of Pentecost. And so that's also read. So when I was thinking about schools this morning and uh, preparing uh, to come and be with you, I thought, well, I'm going to wear my red stole. I'm going to wear it not only because it's Chinese, because it's red too, and it's uh, appropriate for Pentecost. And so this was definitely what we could call a Pentecostal community in Corinth. They were really fired up about the gift of the Holy Spirit in their lives, and they were particularly fired up about the gift of the Holy Spirit. And now, I'm, as I'm looking at you, I'm just realizing I'm wearing uh, Wisconsin red here. <laughs> The gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, particularly in the gift of glossolalia, or the speaking in tongues. That first uh, Sunday when the Holy Spirit was a gift to the church, all of those who were gathered in that upper room went out into the street and started proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ in ways that everyone from all around could understand in their native language. It was if you could have understood right away, and that wasn't just Dennis in the back, who could have understood right away that I'm saying hello in Chinese, and you could hear me saying hello to you. That was definitely a gift. To be able to communicate to people in their native language is definitely a gift, especially in the life of the church. And we should always, uh, well, we should always really appreciate that gift, to be able to communicate to anyone who might be coming through our doors, to be able to proclaim God's good news in a way that they can understand. For sure, that is the highest gift. But somehow in Corinth, we had some trouble. And somehow in Corinth, it, uh, that gift from the Holy Spirit began to be reduced to, well, uh, kind of a clickiness. Or that clicky nature that we encounter in high schools. Those who were able to speak in the language of the angels were the cheerleaders and the football players. <laughs> and those who didn't understand what was going on, well, they were the AV crowd, the theater crowd. Sorry for looking this way as I'm saying that. Uh, <laughs> they were the lesser. And Paul remembers that Actually, it's the lesser who we're supposed to be about. We're not a group that uh, should fall into cliques very easily. We should be constantly trying to reevaluate ourselves and have a good, hard look at ourselves and try to figure out, are we being radically welcoming, radically hosp hospitable? We should try to take a good, hard look at ourselves and are we connecting to the passion that God had called us to when we were first when we first became Christians, when we were the least of these, when we didn't understand the lofty words used in worship. Paul writes to the Corinthians, and he has this uh, first fill in the blank as a quote from Paul's letter. Uh, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom. I did not come. Paul says, I didn't come to, when I first came to share with you the good news of Jesus Christ, I came not speaking in words that you couldn't understand, but in words that you could understand. I didn't come with a lofty ch church speak about the incarnation or about salvation, but I came to you in words that you could understand. I didn't use church jargon, but I came to you using the language that you use. 
So why are you preferencing the language of the angels, the tongues of the angels now, and forgetting about those who can't understand what you're talking about? This reminds me of a video, and I've seen it probably a thousand times. It's Finding Nemo. <laughs> and, I, and it reminds me of this scene when uh, they are about to jump off the EAC, the East Australian Current, uh, to get to Australia. And Squirt is giving Marlon and Dora, Dory the instructions. And he's using jargon. Do we have that video? <laughs> okay. You have your exit done. Okay, Squirt here will now give you a rundown of proper exiting technique. Church, I'll, I'll be okay. Well, 
Paul's reminding us that that's not the case. Just because you learn to print A doesn't mean that you're done. <laughs> In fact, you might need to learn the cursive. In fact, you might need to learn maybe even how to write it in Chinese. In fact, you might need to learn, uh, expand your mind, come up with a whole new word, so that you can share good news to people who need to hear it in their own language. So that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God, which is ever-changing, ever-moving, and ever-dynamic. There is a place for jargon in the life of the church. There is a place for jargon in the life of the church. And that happens uh, among not the immature in faith or the newcomers in faith, but that jargon happens in the life of those who are mature in the faith, the seasoned veterans in the community. I remember when I was a scientist, we did, I often used a lot of jargon. To the point where people would uh, begin to look at me with confused looks, just like uh, Marlon did that squirt there. Even my colleagues would say, you know, I was an expert in my particular field, and I could I, I refer to MMPs and TM TIMPs and uh, inhibitors, and the folks in my lab would sometimes get confused, even though we were speaking the same language. There is a place. For jargon. Let's have that last film in black. Yet among the mature, we do speak wisdom. The jargon helps us have a little bit of shortcuts in our lives. Shortcuts so that we can, those of us who are in the faith, who've experienced a kind of life changing touch of God in our lives, that we don't have to go into a long, detailed uh, description of our journey of faith of that touch, we can just simply say quickly, I had a heartwarming experience. And those of us who are familiar with John Wesley's heart, my heart was strangely warm, automatically know it's a life transforming experience. That's what that means. But we should always be ready for that blank stare. <laughs> what? We should always be ready for that blank stare. And when we say, when someone says to us, well, I don't really know what you mean by that heartwarming, transforming experience. What are you talking about? We should be ready to explain it in the most simple of terms. I, I really, I, I don't remember what movie this came from, but I really, and some of you will probably remember it, so you can remind me after church. But it says, uh, they were trying to explain something to this fellow, a very complicated bit of physics. And he stopped him. He says, okay, well, hold on right there. I want you to re-explain this to me like I am a five-year-old. <laughs> Explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old. Use layman language. Use words that we all can understand. Sometimes this is the most difficult thing. If you get nothing out of this sermon, I invite you to think about that time when your life was touched and transformed that time when you were inspired to take your first step into your new life in Christ Jesus and then try to break it down in words that a five-year-old could understand. Because otherwise, it ends up sounding a lot like those penis teachers. <laughs> 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 The good news is, is you hear it in your own language, you get it, you understand it. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. I get that. Your challenge is weak if you choose to accept it. Learn to say hello in a new language. Read to a child. Teach or learn something new with a friend. <clears throat> I invite the congregation to turn your handle to page 8.